from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. So, well, good afternoon. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you this afternoon for um, a lecture by Professor, Professor <laughs> Kenneth Pomerantz, um, Resisting Imperialism, Resisting Decolonization, Making China from the Ruins of the Qing, 1912 to 1949. Um, and I should introduce myself. I am Carolyn Brown. I direct the John W. Kluge Center here at the library. Um, and it is the Kluge Center in uh, partnership with the National History Center that brings you this lecture. Um, before we begin though, if you would please uh, turn off any cell phones or electrical devices that may go off um, and interfere with the speaker, the recording, the program in some way. Thank you. So a word about the two organizations. The National History Center, promotes research, teaching, and learning in all fields of history. It was created by the American Historical Association in 2002 as a public trust dedicated to the study and teaching of history, as well as to the advancement of historical knowledge in government, business, and the public at large. Um, you can learn more at their webpage, which is not surprisingly at www.nationalhistorycenter.org. The Kluge Center uh, was established here on Capitol Hill um, as a venue where it would be possible for the worlds of scholarship and of public affairs to come together, for the thinkers and the doers, um, as we like to say, to have opportunities for informal conversations. Um, we provide uh, wonderful spaces, in some cases funding, uh, for scholars, both at the very senior level, those are who um, are scholars of the greatest accomplishment, and the rising junior uh, scholars who we hope in time, maybe another 20 years or so, um, will be among the body of our senior scholars. And together, these two groups make a wonderful intellectual community. Uh, the center sponsors lectures, seminars, um, small conferences, and I'm happy to say uh, these wonderful summer seminars that we do in conjunction with National History Center. We've also done some with AHA and one or two other organizations. Um, you can learn more about the uh, Kluge Center um, by picking up a brochure in the back or signing up for um, more information from, uh, from email alerts. Uh, the decolonization seminar, of which this lecture is a part, um, as I noted, is part of this partnership between the Kluge Center of the Library of Congress and the National History Center. But none of it would be possible without the generosity of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, which has funded these seminars for eight years so far. This is the eighth year, and we expect it will go to year 10. Uh, the sem decolonization seminars address the critical period after World War II when the formal colonial powers were relinquishing their empires um, and the large number, huge number actually, of independent states um, were, were born and came uh, into the, to joining the world community. Um, we're really appreciative of the Mellon Foundation uh, for supporting these seminars, because over time they really have created a new historical field of decolonization. Um, to introduce today's speaker, um, we, I want you to meet uh, Dr. Roger Lewis, director of the National History Center. Um, but Dr. Lewis wears many hats, and he probably wears many hats that I don't even know about. Um, his hats in association with the library um, are that um, he's on the Library Scholars Council and has been uh, recently, I guess it was last year, um, the Kluge Chair in Countries and Cultures of the North. And I want you all to mark your calendars because next week, um, same time, same place, next Tuesday, Dr. Lewis 
uh, will be talking about the results of his research here at the library when he was the Kluge Chair. Um, and his talk will be Dimensions of Empire, the Oxford University Press. Um, when we don't, when we're not capturing Dr. Lewis's talents here at the library, he is the Kerr Professor of English History and Culture at the University of Texas, um, and also a professor in the Middle Eastern Studies Department. You can hear more about his great accomplishments next week, um, but let me just say in this connection that he really is the guiding intelligence and force behind the decolonization seminar, um, which brings you this lecture. So please welcome Dr. Roger Lewis. Thank you, Carolyn, for that very gracious uh, introduction. It gives me a great deal of pleasure uh, to introduce a fellow president of the American Historical Association. Uh, Kenneth Pomerantz is one of our leading uh, historians of China. Uh, Ken, or Kenny to his friends, was an undergraduate at Cornell and went on to Yale to study for his uh, PhD. He taught for many years at the University of California at Irvine and has recently moved to the University of Chicago as a university uh, professor. Uh, he is the author as you would suppose, of a great many books and articles. And I want to call attention to two of them because they share a very special uh, distinction. One of them, written, published in 1993, is The Making of a Hinterland, State, Society, and Economy in Inland North China. Uh, and the other famous work, published in the year 2000, is The Great Divergence, China, Europe, and the Making of the Modern World. Uh, the singular distinction that these books share is that they both won the John K. Fairbank Award uh, of the American Historical Association, which is the highest distinction that uh, he could receive for these two books. He is now working on a project that will trace the history of the Chinese political economy from the 17th century to the present in a book entitled, Why is China so big? Which will explain from various uh, perspectives how and why uh, contemporary China's huge landmass and population has wound up forming a single political unit. He will speak to us today on resisting imperialism, resisting decolonization, China in the era 1912-1914. Kenneth Pomerantz. Well, thank you, Roger, and thank you, everybody. It really is very, very nice to be here. I do want to issue a warning, which is that while I jumped at the opportunity to give a talk in the decolonization seminar, it meant that by jumping, I'm presenting work here that I had expected to be finishing about a year from now. So it's still in somewhat rough form, but I hope at least the, the main ideas are sketched out clearly enough to be useful to people. Once upon a time, writing about China and decolonization meant that you were writing about the recovery of the treaty ports and the end of unequal treaties. And that was true regardless of where in the world you were based. But the world has changed. For Western and Japanese historians of China, things began to turn in the 1990s as they joined other historians in questioning the nation state as the default unit of history. Prasenjit Duara, a leader in this effort, emphasized that many of the principal figures 
in the 1911-12 revolution that ended China's monarchy were ethnic, or if you prefer, racial revolutionaries who argued that since China rightfully belonged to the Han Chinese, the Manchu-led Qing dynasty had to go. That in itself was nothing new. But the follow-up questions that Duara and others posed were, why had a self-consciously Chinese republic claiming separateness from Manchus, Mongols, and others quickly pivoted to claim that it should rule Manchuria, Mongolia, Tibet, Xinjiang, and other places where very few Chinese lived? And how had they made this convincing to themselves, to a larger Chinese community, and they made it so convincing that by 1913, just two years into the republic, a substantial portion of the political class was enraged when the president would not go to war with Russia over outer Mongolia. So how did they make it convincing to those people and to much of the international community, which by and large supported China's claims to the former Qing territories? In the ensuing discussion, much has been said about 20th century Chinese states recovering pieces of the Qing Empire, while a parallel literature has explored how the Qing had ruled various borderlands. Inevitably, terms like colonialism and, for the places to which many Chinese migrated, settler colonialism became part of Western scholarly discourse on this topic though these terms have been fiercely resisted in the People's Republic, where the incorporation of places like Xinjiang is always referred to as unification or even reunification, positing a prior unity that the historical record generally doesn't support. Um, Qing scholars on Taiwan, by the way, are somewhere in between on this issue. Yet, so far as I know, nobody has taken what would seem like a logical next step once you've introduced the colonial idea, namely to frame the processes by which a Chinese state held on to almost all of the old Qing Empire, 98% of the people living in its former territory, and about two thirds of the territory itself. And is this gonna work? We have a map up there now. and 80% of the territory lost was outer Mongolia. So the next step would seem to be to frame this not just as the construction of a nation, but as a largely successful resistance to the 20th century wave of decolonization. And to give you a sense, here's, here's the People's Republic today. And if you can sort of mentally toggle back between this slide and the last one, you can get a sense of just how much of the empire winds up as the People's Republic. One reason one might want to think this way, even though it complicates dialogue with our mainland colleagues, is that recent literature has been changing our understanding of who shaped the emerging idea of China. The first answers to how did an anti-Manchu China for the Chinese revolution come to treat non-Chinese areas as naturally theirs came from studying the top revolutionary leaders and ideologues. Sun Yat-sen, Huang Xing, and people like that in the first generation, Chiang Kai-shek, Hu Hanmin, and other nationalist party leaders from the 20s onward, and then eventually Mao and his leading comrades. A second strand of literature, which developed a bit later, looked at how the peoples of the former Qing lands were represented by intellectuals outside of government and in popular culture. So at how journalists, travel writers, historians, eugenicists, map makers, and so on, promoted particular conceptions of proper relations among the Han Chinese, various other nationalities or races, and the the term in Chinese is ambiguous. Minzu can be translated either way, which is a real nuisance for us, but it's simply the case. How it, what the relations among these groups and between these groups and the polity. 
This work generally emphasized how relatively new ideas, like race, were manipulated to naturalize a bounded nation led by a newly constructed Han ethnic group, but including many others. Broader historiographic trends, stressing the novelty of all nations and of Westphalian-style borders, reinforced that focus. So it's not surprising that the answers mostly described a large China being constructed in the 20th century and making the traditional empire in general, rather than the Qing in particular, into a convenient invented ancestor. But one could also say that the Republic was, after all, born as the heir to the Qing specifically, and ask how, A, how did it hold on to the empire, and B, how did it make that seem to be the result of a purely nationalist project, one that was ideologically acceptable in the 20th century, rather than also being an imperial one, which is certainly what some minorities called it at the time, and how, in fact, the Chinese foreign ministry in the 30s and 40s feared it would be seen by the international community. The historiography has thus emphasized discontinuity. It sees the Qing as an old way of holding together this vast expanse, which had failed by 1912, and was replaced more or less from scratch with a new national unity, one which frankly admitted the fact of Han dominance, or at least leadership, and made itself legitimate nonetheless by citing evidence of popular support, sometimes real, sometimes manufactured, from all ethnic groups for a project of what one could call development, modernization, in Chinese was usually referred to as reconstruction, and for the shared goal of resisting domination by Russian, Japanese, and Anglo-Indian others who were even more alien to the nation's minorities than the Han. So the argument as it was often posed to people like Tibetans was, you have the choice between unity, you're not gonna be able to survive on your own. You have the choice between unity with us and people you really have nothing in common with. Um, minority acquiescence in, or even enthusiasm for that project, was based on some combination of its innate appeal, PRC salesmanship, or simply the collapse of other options, as the Japanese and then the British were removed from China's borders. In many versions of this story, especially, though not exclusively, those in the People's Republic, the discontinuity is heightened by making the Republican era into an elaborate, largely counterproductive detour. So the years 1912 to 28 get written off as a set of warlord regimes that had few real achievements and no positive ideology. And then 1925 to 45, excuse me, 28 to 45, gets written off as an era in which heavy-handed Han nationalists, and that's capital N for the Nationalist Party, almost discredited nationalism, small n, by confusing it with ethnic or racial chauvinism, alienating minorities, who then had to be brought back into the fold by the combination of their visceral horror of Japanese depredations, recognition that they couldn't become viable nations on their own, and then finally, innovative Chinese communist policies that allowed them to pursue a distinctive developmental path within a modernizing multi-ethnic state. So that's sort of the received wisdom. And much has been learned by this approach. Understanding how Han Chinese nationalists came to see Xinjiang, Tibet, and so on as rightfully theirs, long before Chinese were anything like a majority there, how various non-Han could come to see themselves as belonging to a Chinese nation, even while often complaining about their status within that nation, and understanding how people came to think of themselves as ethnically Han, Tibetan, Miao, and so on, 
rather than thinking primarily in terms of various other possible classifications, have all been very valuable intellectual projects. We have learned a lot. But there are also phenomena which these approaches don't help us explain. First, most of the periphery never fully dissolved its ties to China proper, even though it could have. So Xinjiang, for instance, in the far northwest, though not really ruled from the center during the early 20th century, hadn't really been ruled from the center under the Qing either, never formally broke with the capital, except for one small splinter group, which didn't last long. And this is even in a period where many heartland provinces, right in the middle of China proper, did have periods of secession where they didn't recognize the capital. Even the Japanese puppet regime in Inner Mongolia in the 30s actually logged fewer days in open defiance of the republic than many parts of China proper did. Secondly, traditional symbols of authority continued to matter a great deal. The nationalist regime's concern with controlling and conferring on selected Mongol princes seals of authority that they claimed had been handed down through the Qing all the way back from Genghis Khan is one example of this. The state's patronage of a new Tibetan Buddhist school beginning in 1930, when the nationalists actually had no physical presence in Tibet, so they set up a Tibetan school in Sichuan, um, accompanied by government-subsidized Tibetan Buddhist ceremonies to seek peace and ask blessings for the republic, would be another. Mao Zedong's 1935 call for the restoration of Qing-era units of government in Inner Mongolia, reversing a nationalist reform that had replaced those with provinces like those in the Chinese interior, would be another example and Chiang Kai-shek's support for a milder measure along similar lines, though it didn't go far enough to satisfy key Mongol princes, would be still another. Last, but in some ways a favorite of mine, the yellow satin that Mao gave to the Dalai Lama on repeated occasions in the 1950s, yellow satin being a traditional gift of emperors to tributary rulers, is arguably a fifth example that extends even into the People's Republic. Nor can the discontinuity approach tell us much about how Republican governments approach the crucial issue of migration into frontier regions. Far from always supporting Han migrants, as we might expect from ethnic nationalists who faced severe land shortages back in China proper, the regime actually went back and forth between encouraging and discouraging these migrants, much as the Qing had, and in ways that seem quite continuous with the evolution of Qing migration policy. Moreover, the Republic also followed the late Qing in trying to make citizens of others, including, for instance, Korean migrants in Manchuria, through a combination of acculturation and economic incentives rather than attempting to expel these Japanese subjects from this contested territory, as you might have expected them to want to do. And Chinese diplomacy, which to a great extent relied on asserting Qing treaty rights, kept even those outer areas that did contemplate a complete break from getting outside recognition. Manchukuo, the three northeastern provinces that became a Japanese puppet state for a while, was recognized only by a few Axis states plus the Vatican. Outer Mongolia received almost no foreign recognition until well after World War II. And various key powers indicated preemptively that they would not support any Tibetan claim of full formal sovereignty. So basically they told Tibetan elites, don't even think about it. All of these things suggest that we view China in the first half of the 20th century as, among other things, sort of a normal colonial power, which having inherited the Qing Empire, struggled to keep decolonization at bay as much as possible across the next 40 years. Like the Qing before them, 
who faced challenges to their rule in many places during the 19th century. And much like the Western colonial powers facing such challenges in the 20th, they relied on a mixture of two often contradictory strategies to shore up their legitimacy. One was patronage of traditional elites and what were thought to be traditional lifeways, um, perhaps best exemplified in Western imperialism by Lord Lugard, but many other examples. The other was a developmental imperialism that promised progress in living standards, literacy, public health, and so on under a colonial tutelage that might or might not also lead to political independence in some distant future. This being a project more akin to the French civilizing mission, the American promise to the Philippines, the Japanese promise to much of their empire. But since Chinese regimes had very little capital available to invest in their frontier territories, the developmental option was really only open to them where the area might accompany a large inflow of what China proper could export in abundance, namely people. Thus, the developmental strategy for holding on to parts of the old Qing domains involved dynamics of settler colonialism, which were quite different from those in most, though not all, 20th century European colonies. European colonies, of course, also brought plenty of settlers, but they were mostly Chinese or Indian immigrants whom the regime could disown when it needed to. Um, the Chinese Republic didn't really have that option for its citizens who moved into places like Xinjiang or Inner Mongolia. At any rate, this strategy faced severe ecological limits in much of the old Qing frontier. Um, there simply wasn't enough water, among other things, for mass immigration until very recent 20th, late 20th century technological changes, which made a much wider range of livelihoods possible in arid and semi-arid areas. Holding on to those territories through at least mid-century then required far more reliance on old kinds of imperial patronage than is often realized, which was often at odds with statements that tended to rhetorically emphasize developmentalism and ethnic nationalism. The Republic actually managed this conflict more successfully than is often realized, even if it was the People's Republic that was the ultimate beneficiary. So what's the evidence? To begin with, it's worth noting that a great many of the officials who helped hold China's territory together in the Republic were Qing holdovers and never embraced the new discourses of race, nationality, and ethnicity. Yang Zhengxin, who governed Xinjiang from 1912 until his assassination in 1928, had been a Qing local official in Xinjiang, and before that, in heavily Muslim parts of adjacent Gansu province. Like many Qing frontier officials, he came from another frontier area, in this case Yunnan, so people who had experience with minorities were shuffled around, but usually didn't deal with the same minorities they had had pre prior experience with. Yang showed no enthusiasm whatsoever for republicanism, and he based his policies on a classic imperial strategy of co-opting local elites of all groups and balancing their interests. He was contemptuous of ethnic nationalism, and he generally tried to minimize Han immigration which he saw as destabilizing. His chief political allies in the province and the objects of his most extensive patronage were Dungan Muslims. He declined to build a significant army, counting on internal conflict in the Soviet Union to buy time. And he did this because he didn't see any way that Xinjiang itself could afford a significant army until subsidies from the Chinese interior could resume at least the scale that they had reached under the Qing. And this is a really crucial point, that the empire under the Qing had never paid for itself. It had always had to be subsidized from the center, 
And so when the center is in trouble, holding on becomes a major project um, and it has to be done on a shoestring. The small army that Yang did build had almost no Han Chinese in it. He deliberately did not arm his own ethnic group or the group that was mo had most in common with people back in the national core. That he was Han Chinese himself continued rather than breaking with Qing trends. The number of Han Chinese officials and frontier posts had been rising steadily since about 1800, including all the governors of Xinjiang once it became a province in 1884. After Yang was assassinated in 1928, there was a brief interlude of aggressive, modernizing state building under a man named Jin Xiran, one that required much greater fiscal extraction and thereby alienated, among other things, Mongol aristocrats, key lamas and imams, because religious property was in some cases confiscated, and other elites. Lacking support from these groups, Jin had to do what Yang had very consciously avoided, backing immigration, in this his case of Gansu famine refugees, both Han and non-Han, incidentally, redistributing land away from traditional elites to give these immigrants a way to make money, and so on. This backfired, and Jin lasted only three years. His successor, Shang Shizai, had to make many concessions to the Soviet Union in return for financial and military rescue. But significantly, the informal Soviet protectorate that evolved under Shang unlike the Japanese protectorate in Manchukuo, never abandoned its nominal fealty to the republic. They always remained a province on paper. And this allowed Nanjing to play a long game here, to just wait the situation out. And interestingly, they built their legitimacy here by rhetorically catering to the special concerns of the area's Muslims, not its Han colonists, and emphasizing not a modernizing role for themselves, but a role of imperial protector of the status quo. Meanwhile, the protectorate also patronized diverse local elites, though it drew the line at Muslim, at Muslim clerics and nomads. And it discouraged large-scale immigration, even while building an infrastructure for more direct rule, highways, government printing presses, some irrigated farming, mining for export, etc., which was mostly run by a few common turn trained Han Chinese and Uyghurs. And again, it's crucial that it's both groups. Then, just as the Soviets, who were bankrolling most of this, sought to cash in their IOUs and tighten control over Xinjiang, they were diverted by the Nazi invasion and Shang Shizai could turn back to the nationalists in China as his main patron. With the only land routes between Moscow and Yan'an, not to mention the northern part of the anti-Japanese front, running through Xinjiang, Moscow couldn't repudiate Shang entirely, and China wound up being able to appropriate the framework for provincial government and for later post-49 colonization that Moscow had helped build. Now, Yang Zhengxin was atypical in his explicit desire to maintain as much of the Qing as he could. But other Qing holdovers also held frontier posts, and they continued many old policies. In general, ethnic nationalist revolutionaries turn out to have been much less central to shaping post-1912 Chinese government than we used to think. And that includes being much less central to shaping what one scholar has called the modern Chinese geobody, both on the ground and in the collective imagination. For one thing, contrary to what my generation was taught in graduate school, Westphalian-style borders had not been alien to Qing thinking even as far back as 
as the 1689 Nerchinsk Treaty with Russia. The idea of drawing firm lines on a map rather than imagining either that sovereignty faded out gradually or that it followed subjects wherever they went was part of managing disputes not only with Westerners but with other Asian states such as Vietnam. It was not always the preferred modality, but it was certainly part of the Qing repertoire. Indeed, in late imperial negotiations with Russia, Korea, and Japan over contested parts of Manchuria, it was actually the Qing more than the other powers who insisted that sovereignty was absolute within a clearly bounded territory, and that therefore, for instance, Koreans who settled on the Chinese side of the border could and should become Chinese subjects. Moreover, it appears that the Qing, once again, in contrast to what I was taught in graduate school, actually used Zhongguo, the term we translate as China, quite regularly to refer to the territory of their empire, not just to a cultural ideal. And it's very clear that this formula at least included Manchuria, along with the old China proper, and probably included everything that they ruled. Indeed, this term that we call China came up particularly often in discussions of the border with Russia. And so it had to be referring to Manchuria and Mongolia for the most part. So in some conceptual sense, those areas had already been included. These notions mattered not only because they influenced officials, including the many Qing holdovers who represented China overseas in the Republican Foreign Ministry, but also because they shaped the China that a broader elite and later others took to be their territory and people. It is unclear exactly how and when the ideas of educated Chinese as to what constituted China came to include specific outer territories. But the main point I want to make is that substantial changes clearly predated the post-1895 wave of translated foreign texts that has sometimes been thought to mark the beginnings of nationalist thinking in China. In many cases, inclusion in this imagined Qing or Chinese geobody also predated the arrival of any significant number of Han Chinese migrants to a region. It's worth noting, for instance, that when the Qing finished conquering Xinjiang in 1759, many Han literati and officials actually advocated abandoning it. The Dzungar threat had been destroyed, the area was not traditionally part of the empire, and continued occupation, as everybody realized, would cost a fortune. However, 70 years later, after two expensive wars to hold on to Xinjiang, and under much more straitened fiscal circumstances, voices advocating retreat had become much, much fewer. And a new group of Han Chinese intellectuals and officials argued that the best solution to the high cost of keeping Xinjiang was not to pull back, but to encourage more immigration, more irrigation, more mining, and so on, so that local taxes could fund the enterprise. After much more costly violence in the 1860s and 70s, nobody that I know of supported retreat from Xinjiang except as a temporary tactical measure. And there was also very little interest in the rebels' offer that they would resume acknowledging and offering tribute to Beijing in return for substantial local autonomy. In other words, somehow the idea that Xinjiang is ours had penetrated a large part of the educated Han Chinese class that hadn't had that idea at the time the Qing first conquered the place. Instead, not long after these 1870s revolts were snuffed out, Xinjiang became a province, sealing its conceptual integration into China, even though ethnic Han would remain a small minority in the region until well after 1949. Part of what was going on, I think, 
was that from about 1800 forward, Chinese literati and officials were reimagining who the good civilized imperial subject was. Previously, the idea was that that person had to be a farmer. Increasingly, though, the idea was voiced that what matters is that they have steady employment, that they be able to settle down in one place, be entered into the population registers because they're staying still, have enough income to raise a family, and therefore have a stake in society. But that doesn't have to go with necessarily being a farmer. And this is critical for a number of reasons, but one of them, I think, is if you can imagine non-farmers as good subjects, as long as they stay put, then you can imagine the arid parts of the, outside, of the outer empire as potentially civilizable in a way that you really couldn't before. Previously, those areas could really only be buffer zones that you had for utilitarian purposes. Now they could be thought of as potentially part of us. Um, that, a further discussion of that is really a paper for another day, except insofar as I hope it reinforces my general effort here to blur the opposition, at least for the Chinese case, between modern nation building on one hand and solidifying and prolonging the life of an early modern empire on the other. Whatever the reasons behind it, the Qing rethinking of ethnically non-Han outer regions as part of China had its effects, even on people who were vehemently anti-Qing and deeply attached to preaching classical understandings of Chinese-ness, which had excluded steppe societies very firmly. When Zhang Binglin rewrote the ancient but still very popular reading primer, the three-character classic in 1928, he added a passage equating the mythological nine divisions, which were supposed to be sort of the founding moment of Chinese governance, with the republic's 22 provinces, the 18 inherited from Ming times, plus all of Manchuria and Xinjiang. By contrast, Taiwan, which the Qing had formally ceded in 1895, albeit reluctantly, very rarely appeared in Chinese Republican discourse as a place that needed to be recovered, despite its overwhelmingly Han Chinese population, a Han Chinese population far larger than that in Xinjiang, not to mention Tibet, and about 50% more even than that in rapidly sinifying Inner Mongolia. Indeed, the nationalists maintained a consulate in Taipei until the outbreak of World War II. And they never formally demanded the island's return until 1943. It seems not to have become a major issue, even to communist leaders, until Chiang Kai-shek and Dean Acheson made it an unavoidable one. Changes in what people imagined to be part of China may have been particularly important in the case of Tibet, where China's physical presence was minimal and the terrain made mass immigration unthinkable, at least until late 20th century engineering came along. So too, and for the same reason, patronage relationships among officials, aristocrats, and clerics were especially crucial in keeping Tibet at least loosely within a Chinese orbit. And the Qing heritage was central to these stories, though it's far from the whole story. At the start of the Qing, there had been no recognition that what we now call Tibetan Buddhism and Chinese Buddhism were both branches of the same religion. The Tibetan creed was called the Lama's teachings in China proper, and it was in very low repute. It was associated with despised, uncivilized Mongol invaders, and the Ming had actually banned any Chinese from practicing it. So when the Qing instead became ostentatious patrons of Tibetan religion and brought many Tibetan monks to China, um, perhaps as many as 5,000 in Beijing alone in 1790, 
they were not only increasing their political leverage in Central Asia, though that was their main concern, and perhaps seeking personal enlightenment, they were also unknowingly laying the groundwork for the post-1890 discovery that Chinese and Tibetans and Manchus and Mongols as well all practice versions of a religion called Buddhism and that this could help underwrite political unity. The Qing established important routines for this patronage. They conferred titles on Tibetan Buddhist religious leaders, many of which included the term protector of the country, and the country clearly meant the whole empire, including China. They funded Tibetan Buddhist publications from favored monasteries. They worked with and promoted various lamas, and they influenced whatever successions they could. All of these practices were revived after a short lapse during the Republic, and they were probably as important in the long run as the much discussed Qing resident and the tiny Qing garrison in Lhasa were in cementing Chinese claims to Tibet. With the 13th Dalai Lama, who's on the throne from 1879 to 1933, and the aristocrats around him engaging in a Lhasa-based state building and centralization project of their own after 1895, many prestigious other Tibetan aristocrats and clerics were alienated, right? They didn't want to see themselves subordinated to Lhasa. Many of them wound up in exile in China proper. And especially after 1929, both the nationalist regime and lay Buddhist elites in China worked closely with these exiles, including the Panchen Lama, the second most important, on a whole series of both religious and political projects. As best we can tell, the nationalists' attempts to sell their official theory of the five nationalities, or five races if you prefer that translation, namely the theory that the Han, Mongols, Manchus, Tibetans, and Hui, Chinese Muslims, were distinct groups but closely related to each other. This seems to have largely fallen flat, at least among Tibetans. And the idea that demography alone made it impossible for non-Han peoples to survive as independent states, so they therefore needed to join China, was actually never terribly compelling when you think about it. Tibet had roughly the same population as Afghanistan, which survives as an independent state, much more than various other highland kingdoms that managed to become sovereign states, and about five times the population of Outer Mongolia. So that idea didn't particularly resonate either. But the idea of a shared Buddhist culture and history does seem to have resonated, as did the idea among both Tibetan religious leaders an influential Chinese Buddhist laity, that their religion needed Tibet and China united in a single polity. This provided protection, not only in theory to the Tibetan Buddhists, but to Chinese Buddhists as well. Um, so for instance, a big reason why the nationalists agreed in 1931 to protect the property of all Buddhist monasteries and temples which had been under attack in the previous decade, was precisely that they were afraid of hurting Tibetan and Mongolian Buddhist sentiments. And Chinese Buddhists in China proper were well aware of this and saw the advantages for both of them of promulgating this idea of a shared Buddhism that had branches rather than different religions. Sino-Tibetan religious collaboration, both with and without official government participation, became increasingly common in the late 30s and during World War II, giving increasing credibility to Chinese government promises of religious tolerance. That, in turn, seems to have had a significant influence on this decision of the new 16-year-old Dalai Lama not to flee Tibet when Chinese troops entered in 1951, even though we now know that the CIA was promising him support if he did so. And that, in turn, 
help the Chinese Communist Party get through perhaps the shakiest single moment in its consolidation of control. One of the key mediators in these discussions, Sharap Gyatso, was a monk who had founded progressive Buddhist schools in Tibet with Chinese government financial support, had studied at the partly government-funded Sino-Tibetan Buddhist Institute in Chongqing, an institute explicitly dedicated to the idea that Chinese and Tibetan Buddhism were one, and so on. And as already noted, Mao probably buttressed this sense that continuity in Tibet was likely by using a substantial amount of old Qing protocol until 1958-59. One of the most urgent joint tasks of the nationalist government and Tibetan religious leaders, one that, for instance, took up a lot of the Panchen Lama's time, was keeping Inner Mongolia tied to China and especially keeping it out of the orbit of Japan and the Japanese puppet state in Manchuria. Now, when Outer Mongolia had first seceded, it might be better to go back so you get a sense of this, had first seceded during the 1911 revolution, it did so as an explicit theocracy, something we tend to forget in 20th century nationalist narratives. And the argument its leaders made was that their ties to the Qing had been based on the court's patronage of their religion, and that the anticipated cessation of that practice by the new republic left them with no reason to remain part of China. Now, that secession was partially reversed by 1914, while some government patronage quickly resumed. After a second and final secession brought outer Mongolia under Soviet protection, the Soviets quickly reneged on their promises of religious tolerance. And this matters for us partly because it ended any chance of inner Mongolian elites finding a union of all Mongols in a single state as appealing. This all Mongols should have the same state idea had been quite popular from the turn of the century down to the 20s. But at least among the Mongol upper class, the attraction of that fades utterly when they see what the Soviet Union is doing to Buddhist monasteries. Some younger inner Mongolians did support, continue to support this idea, but that's a different story. There were two contradictory Qing legacies in Inner Mongolia, mapping quite easily, I think, onto the two kinds of strategies for holding colonial territory that I discussed earlier. On the one hand, the Qing had conferred titles, hereditary offices, and rights to both land use and labor services on Mongol princes and lamas, and sought to rule through these traditional elites. On the other hand, Han migrants had been drifting into the area and converting pasture land to farms since the early 18th century. And they came in increasing numbers after 1902, when fiscal pressures caused the Qing to start promoting more intensive economic development. While central government policies, both under the Qing and under the Republic, called for compensating Mongols, which basically meant compensating elite Mongols, for the conversion of pasture to farmland in ways that were supposed to make development consistent with continually continuing to rule through, local, through old elites. And Mongol nobles were theoretically in charge of deciding which land would be converted to farms. This often proved hard to implement in practice. Consequently, officials went back and forth continually between the horns of this dilemma. They vacillated on immigration restrictions and also on resolving the jurisdictional conflicts between the prince-led local governments inherited from the mid-Qing and the sometimes overlapping counties created after 1890 to govern farmers and other immigrants. There were only two brief though fateful, moments in which traditionalist strategies for holding on to the region were really abandoned. 
One was in 1929, just after the nationalists took North China. The other was in 1935-36, when discussions about a Mongol autonomous zone within China broke down acrimoniously. The Mongol Prince De turned to collaboration with the Japanese, and the nationalists in response became even less compromising. And you had what seemed like a total break. And even that wasn't a total break. After the war, the nationalists actually forgave Prince De for having accepted Japanese sponsorship for his regime and sought to work with him again. Now, it didn't help in trying to calibrate these traditional and developmental approaches to Inner Mongolia. The estimates of how many immigrants the area could support by converting pastures to farmland and thus how much government revenue it could generate varied wildly. One 1929 official estimate went as high as 80 million farmers who could supposedly be accommodated here, while the total population in fact never got above four and a half million. But note that even that four and a half million was enough to leave ethnic Mongols as less than 20% of the population in their home territory. Given that demographic reality and the fantasies that the much larger projected populations must have suggested to officials presiding over impoverished North China, which would have loved to get rid of some people, it's striking that a succession of regimes facing those facts and supposedly dominated by modernizing Han ethnic nationalists, nonetheless continued to focus as much as they did on wooing Mongols with aristocratic pedigrees while restricting settlement. Even as late as 1947, the nationalists' chief official in Inner Mongolia, a man named Fu Zhuoyi, argued that the autonomy movement there really didn't matter as long as the princes weren't supporting it. Now, one could, I suppose, fit this into a picture in which you argue that the nationalist government was just utterly clueless, but that seems to me implausible, right? They, they had people on the ground. They knew what was going on, and they felt, even given the things that I've described, that continuing the older practices of elite patronage and indirect rule was at least as viable a strategy as encouraging the migrants and encouraging ethnic nationalism. Now, given that the nationalists did court Mongol nobles, it's then no surprise that patronage of Buddhist institutions was crucial. Um, probably somewhere around half of male Mongols took a Lamaist title at some point during their life that the nationalists made very little effort ever to build a mass base for themselves in this region, either among the Han settlers or among the so-called young Mongols who opposed the prin princes and supported a more developmentalist agenda, left them heavily dependent on such traditional elite-centered and symbolic strategies, that they nonetheless couldn't escape being associated with settler-led change that upset traditional elites made it hard to succeed on this basis, and it left them very vulnerable after the war to a Chinese Communist Party that had a mass base and army in immediately adjacent areas. But that does not change the fact that traditional statecraft had been crucial to keeping Inner Mongolia in play during 30 plus years when the Chinese state was at its weakest and other empires to which frontier populations could have attached themselves, the Japanese, the Soviet, were very much available. In short, the so-called reunification of today's People's Republic was not a sudden 1940s recovery after the Qing vanished and blundering Republican regimes failed for 30 years to find ways to simultaneously appeal to Han and non-Han. Instead, the CCP in many ways built on Republican era efforts to stave off the loss of the outer Qing dependencies. 
These blended both new and old strategies and were surprisingly successful given both the fate of other multinational empires in the 20th century and the considerable turmoil within China proper. When we see this as not just modern nation building, but also as resisting the decolonization that might have been expected to follow from the Qing fall, I think we get a clearer picture of how much strategies carried over from the Qing empire continue to matter well into the middle of the 20th century. My point here is not to say it's the maintenance of traditional empire rather than modern state building, but to say that the two operated simultaneously, sometimes in parallel, sometimes grinding against each other, and sometimes as a surprisingly smooth synthesis. In seeing things this way, we also get to put China's nation building project into the context of longer running ones, including a Qing politics of empire that had always included both the paternalistic incorporation of outlying areas with the promise of as little change as was necessary for security and a Confucian version of the civilizing mission that conceptually at least could easily morph into a modernizing one. Using that longer perspective, we should note that over the course of the 19th century, it became increasingly clear that the outer parts of the Qing Empire, acquired for forward defense, not as an adjunct to the pursuit of profit, were financially unaffordable. Meanwhile, over the same century, especially at its tail end, but beginning many decades earlier, a combination of growing external threats and ideological changes, partially, though only partially engineered from above, had increased the Han majority's identification with the larger empire and made simply abandoning the outer territories increasingly unthinkable, even as holding them became increasingly difficult. All these trends continued, indeed accelerated, for decades beyond the fall of the Qing. So all strategies for holding pieces of the empire remained in play. There was no sharp break, as we used to think, between Qing culturalism and ethnic nationalism, between paternalist patronage and developmentalism, or from what Fred Cooper and Jane Burbank in a different context call an imperial politics of difference and a national model of assimilation. Even now, China's inner Asian provinces run massive deficits and are, of course, the site of much discontent. And while the post-1990 program to develop the West has shifted very strongly towards promoting rapid economic growth and lots of Han immigration as strategies for resolving these problems, largely dropping the old idea of holding on to these areas through patronage of traditional elites, the goal is still for each so-called nationality to become a modernized version of itself, not to become a group indistinguishable from the Han. This is not a melting pot model. In the first half of the century, China, even more than its Soviet and Japanese rivals, lacked the resources to make good on developmentalist promises in frontier regions even lacked the means to fund from the heartland an army that would hold the outer regions by force. So it's not surprising that traditionalist strategies had to be central for statesmen seeking to prolong the life of the old, of the old empire. And here I think it mattered crucially that Qing practices had been flexible enough to gradually strengthen the mental identification, both at home and abroad, of China with the whole Qing realm on the one hand, while still cultivating frontier elites who had everything to lose from political, economic, or cultural sinification on the other hand. It was the triumph of 20th century Chinese leaders working with those among frontier elites who were not particularly interested in independent nationhood to slow down decolonization long enough <laughs> 
for new bases of unity to emerge, different in each place, which updated and supplemented rather than replacing the old ones. Call it nation building with Qing characteristics. Thank you. We have time for a few questions, and we have a microphone here. So if you uh, raise your hand, and the professor will call on you, and I'll come around. Uh, yes, Professor Pomerantz, when you discuss these Chinese intellectuals debating uh, the agrarian way of life versus the commercial, it sounded uncannily like what was simultaneously going on in Scotland with Lord Kames and his distant cousin David Hume, where they were defending the, uh, the modern commercial life. And there they were in a backward country, Scotland, mm -hmm. which became the most advanced society of, of the world. Would you care, comment on that parallel? Um, it's interesting you should raise it, because one of my colleagues raised exactly the same parallel over dinner. Um, and I haven't quite thought it through yet. I mean, the, the Chinese story is, you know, it's 50 to 60 years later. It's really in the early 19th century that you get this um, discussion of non-agrarian ways of life. I think it comes from a bunch of different things, but in part it comes from, I think, simple recognition of demographic realities that sometime circa 1800, Chinese literati become aware that there are simply too many people for an all agricultural society. They're aware of the fact that migrants are already moving into other areas and doing other things. And so they, they want to see if these people can be in a sense, rehabilitated. Um, the Chinese term for migrant, or at least one of the Chinese terms for migrant, liomin, literally means something closer to drifter, and it's a very pejorative term, right? The basic idea is that those who don't stay put are already, they're not quite irredeemable, but they're headed in the direction of becoming bad people, people who are unsuited to be imperial subjects. And I think what begins to happen circa 1800 is you get a group of reformist Han Chinese intellectuals who say the distinction shouldn't be between farming and non-farming. That misses the point. The distinction is between settled folk who the state can register because they stay in one place and who will marry and have descendants and therefore have a stake in society and not want to move around because their ancestors will be buried there. And those folks can be good subjects. And you begin to hear that occasionally even in the 18th century. You begin to hear it a lot in the 19th century. And that obviously, I've been tracing it mostly in the southwestern province of Yunnan, where a lot of it is a discussion about miners and whether miners can be good subjects and therefore whether we should encourage mining or not. But I think it matters to the northwest as well. Because obviously, if, if only the only basis for a truly civilized polity is agriculture, then much of the step can never really be civilized. And that is an idea that's actually very powerful in the Chinese tradition. It, you, know, you'll, you hear it articulated as far back as the third century BCE, and it comes back again and again and again, not without contestation, but it comes back again and again and again. Now you begin to hear more people argue, you know, people who do these other things can be like us, and I think the subtext, though it's rarely phrased explicitly that way until the 20th century is, and therefore those places can be not just buffer zones, 
they can be made virtuous, for better or worse. I think you have to wait for the microphone. I have a question about the timeline for decolonization because you're making a very interesting parallels mm -hmm. in a question about decolonization, except you're kind of taking the timeline to a much earlier, to the basically the fall of multinational empires, which mm -hmm. is not uh, particularly, it's not the standard timeline. Right. And I, I'm, I'm very curious about why do you make that, um, or is that an intervention about decolonization in general? Um, I think there are a couple of things going on here. I mean, one is I do want to think about the Qing both in comparison to the other multinational empires and in comparison with the European overseas empires and blur that line a little bit. Um, you know, and the Ottoman case is perhaps the one that already blurs it, right? Um, you know, what exactly are, I mean, it's true there's no, you can get from Istanbul to the rest of the empire without crossing an ocean, but by the time you're in the Arabian Peninsula and North Africa, you're in a pretty different world. Um, so part of that is an attempt to sort of blur this distinction, but part of it is also to remember that, you know, there is a kind of decolonization that wasn't after World War I, right? It was not obvious in 1917, 1918, that the end of the war wouldn't mean at least the breakup of the colonial empires of the defeated, right? Um, nobody knew in advance, or at least the general public didn't know in advance, that places in the Middle East weren't going to become independent states, right? That China was not going to get Shandong back, that, you know, all sorts of things. So I think, you know, I, I don't want to blur things too much, because obviously there are things that are very different about 1945 from 1918. But I think we should remember that it's not a foregone conclusion that decolonization you know, only happens the second time around. So yeah, I, there is a, a certain deliberate blurring going on there in the back. Hi. Uh, your presentation uh, implies, or perhaps it's the use of the maps, implies that in, uh, except in the case of Taiwan, the, if you will, natural boundaries of the entire China were uh, seen to be pretty much the same 100 years ago as they are today. Uh, the, the extent to which the Han rule should extend over these um, colonized territories, if you will, reached um, defined boundaries. Is that what you mean to say, or is in fact, was in fact there a, a blurring of where they thought the, the end of their empire should be? Um, there certainly is a blurring. And for instance, the, for instance, the boundary between Manchuria and Korea is contested from the 1880s all the way down to 1949. Um, it's contested between, obviously, different regimes at different moments, since both who rules in Beijing and who rules in Seoul, Pyongyang, et cetera, changes. Um, so it's not that the boundaries were absolutely fixed. Um, and obviously, there is the rather large, at least in territorial terms, loss of Outer Mongolia. But I do want to argue, again, I think it's contrary to a lot of the scholarly literature, that while we focused a lot on anti-Manchu revolutionaries in 1911, and by doing that, we make a big puzzle of the, well, then how did they stake a claim to all these territories where there were no Han Chinese to speak of, right, where the only link was through the Qing Empire? I think the more we read, the more we're realizing that underneath those revolutionaries that we've been following, there were an awful lot of provincial and local officials and second rank intellectuals and so forth 
for whom 1912 is not such a huge break. They had always thought in terms that were much more shaped by the Qing. Um, they had gradually come to think of all of the empire as Zhongguo, as China, and that they carried that thinking you know, straight through into the Republic and had a lot more influence than we've customarily realized. Right? So that you know, something like the way that between 1759 and the mid-19th century, Chinese began to take it for granted that Xinjiang was part of whatever you want to call it, the Middle Kingdom, our empire, et cetera, that that really matters, right? Because Lord knows in the 19th century and the early 20th, there would have been plenty of good reasons to just say, this place is far away, lots of the people there are not like us, it costs a fortune, we got problems at home, and you know, for most of the last 2,000 years, nobody who looks like us or speaks our language has set foot in them. Let's get out. And they don't do it. They, you know, it's quite striking to me that they seem, until the last minute, much more willing to give up on Taiwan, which did have an ethnic Han majority, but which the Qing had formally said, OK, not ours anymore. I mean, I think, you know, as I said earlier, this is a project still in formation. And I think there are parts of this that still need to be worked out. But I'm more and more struck by how much both, Qing, both the Qing material legacy, but even more the Qing way of rethinking what parts of the jigsaw puzzle belong together actually appears to have penetrated the minds of people who thought they were Chinese nationalists, and in some cases thought they were anti-Manchu Chinese nationalists. I mean, when I mentioned Zhang Binglin, one of the reasons he's a good example is that this guy was a virulent, virulent anti-Manchu racist, I mean, who wrote you know, the most amazing things about you know, essentially subhuman qualities of the Manchus, and yet at the same time, he changes this classical text to claim that it refers to not the 18 provinces that had been ruled by the Ming, but the 22 provinces, those that had been ruled by the Ming, plus the three in the Northeast, plus Xinjiang, which isn't added till 1884. Last question. Okay. Um, well, we got two over here. I think I saw the hand in the far back first. May I ask two questions, please? Okay. Number one, even down to Manchurian China, China never colonized Okinawa or Korea. So the label of empire to modern China, would you mind explain a little bit about your judgment? Mm -hmm. And number two, during the period of 1927 to 1937, in most coastal cities, China literacy had the highest level of freedom for cultural expression, especially the rapid growth of higher education system. So would you mind uh, give your judgment during this period of time in regard of the decolonization uh, of modern China from 1927 to 37? Thank you. OK, I mean, in regard to the first part of the question, it's certainly true that the, the empire was finite. Um, I think it always was finite. Um, you know, that too is in some ways a rethinking of what my generation was taught in graduate school. Right? We were taught that the old Chinese notion was that there was tianxia, all under heaven, and that sovereignty in the traditional Chinese idea was not bounded. Right, that theoretically it was limited only by the emperor's virtue, and if the emperor were truly virtuous enough, the entire world would come to him. Right? And we, that, was, that was the Fairbank argument, that that was the way the Chinese saw the world, and that was part of why 
They wanted to fit places like Britain into a tributary framework, et cetera, et cetera. And we now have 30 plus years of literature that says, yeah, but, <laughs> right? That says alongside that Tianxia framework had always been a lot of discourse and a lot of practical statecraft that asked questions about, well, where should our domain end? You know, we all know it's not really infinite. And that answered that in various different ways. So for the step, many people answered it, as I said in answering another question, they answered it by saying, you know, we can have buffer states out there, but those people are inherently not like us. They can't be like us. With respect to a place like Korea, the argument was different. The argument was, we don't need to rule those places. They understand the way. And we can rule them indirectly because they govern themselves in accordance with civilized principles. So either civilizational commonality or civilizational difference, depending, could both be justifications for limiting the empire um, for obvious reasons given the territories I've been talking about today the focus has been more on the places where civilizational difference had been the principle that in the past had been thought to limit empire and that I would argue become less binding in the 20th century or really starting in the 19th century as people start to think you could be a good subject and live in ways other than as a farmer um, in answer to the second part of your question, it's certainly true that the Chinese people who live in the lower and middle Yangtze Valley and along the coast down as far as Guangzhou are the best off materially and in certain ways the freest, though freedom has many faces. Right? The state intervenes in those people's lives a lot more than it does the lives of a lot of other people. Um, in terms of prosperity, those parts of the, you know, had been the richest parts of China for close to a thousand years. Right? So their relative prosperity, you know, is nothing new in the 20s and 30s. Their relative freedom is a more interesting case. Right? One could on the one hand, if you take, for instance, the Yangtze Delta, right, which is kind of the core of all cores, um, by far the most heavily taxed place in the empire, um, and remains that way, actually, not only through the republic, but once again, under the People's Republic. Um, on the other hand, one could argue that in return for those large fiscal contributions, local elites, in the Yangtze Delta got an awful lot of autonomy. Um, that wasn't all that much use to peasants in the lower Yangtze, but you know, in how much of the world were ordinary people free from the power of their local elites in the 19th century? Um, so I, I don't think that that concentration of relative well-being, et cetera, in this regional core you know, tells us all that much about the political system. I mean, after all, at the core of the British Empire sits a place that's pretty well off and where people are pretty free in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Doesn't make it any less an empire for the rest of the people. The Qing, of course, are very different in that people from the lower Yangtze don't sit on the throne. Um, in the Republic, you could argue people from the lower Yangtze do start to run the show much more. But obviously, the relationship between power and wealth is very different, right? As I said earlier, the empire was never designed as an adjunct to profit making, the way you could argue that the European overseas empires were. And that has all kinds of implications. It's a different kind of empire. I hate to bring this uh, wonderful uh, 
discussion to conclusion, but we are way over time, which is all right. But um, we also have a reception waiting in the back. So please thank our speaker and join us next week. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.